All right, well, we're starting a brand new series called Awe and Wonder. Um, it's only going to be a couple weeks going through the um, time of Christmas. And to be honest, I have been thinking about this series um, since the spring and this concept since the spring. In fact, we had a uh, kind of a content planning meeting. And this is one of the things I'm like, man, I, this is something I want to talk about, but I just don't know exactly how to talk about. And I've kind of been wrestling with it ever since. But I figured Christmas was, would be kind of the perfect time. Um, and we're going to be talking about awe and wonder, awe and wonder. I just want to ask a question. When was the last time that you were actually in awe? of something. Like, not a, oh, that's neat. That's cool. You know, or somebody's like, you know, sometimes my kids are like, oh, here's a, here's a drawing. And I'm like, wow, that's, you only marginally went outside the lines on that one, right? Like, you know, but, but there's a lot of times that we kind of like feign this sense of, of, of wowness and aweness and wonder. Um, well, what's interesting and, and what I found to be really kind of riveting uh, is as I was going through this class, and the professor, who was brilliant, by the way, her name is Dr. Andrews, um, and I had the opportunity to take it. It's a class called Creativity and Innovation. It kind of teaches you systematically that kind of everybody's creative, and you can be kind of the, the methods and the strategies and what that means and what that looks like. She was um, former. She currently owns a boutique where she works specifically with um, executives and people in higher ed. Um, she was formerly the dean of the MBA program at MIT. So, you know, she only applied herself, right? She'd do something. Um, just a real dull crayon. I used to tell her, I was like, you know, if you just tried, Dr. Andrews, I've never said that in my life. But but um, one of the articles that we read talked about the idea of awe and talked about the idea of wonder. And it talked about it in a way that was different than I had heard it talked about before. And so I kind of want to lead into our discussion by reading to you a couple excerpts of an article that we read that, I, as I'm telling you, as I read this, I would just underline and just pause for like a minute or two and just sit there and think like, like this is different. This is helpful. This is interesting. This is, in fact, many of you have done this before. You read something that has no spiritual, this is what the Bible said. In fact, I wouldn't even totally recommend this article because part of what it recommends in terms of it producing awe and wonder is some psychology psychedelic, you know, um, catalysts, we'll say. But the, uh, the, what was talked about was fascinating. So this is what it said. This is what it said. Um, this, is, this is from the, uh, the, the assigned reading that we have. It says, uh, what exactly is awe and where does it come from? It's a subjective feeling rooted in the body, according to psychologist and pioneering awe researcher Dacre Keltner at the University of California, Berkeley. In 03, he and Jonathan Heidet, who's now at the univers New York University, published the first scientific definition. They described awe as the feeling we get when confronted with something vast that transcends our frame of reference and that we struggle to understand. It's an emotion, and you hear this, it's an emotion that combines amazement with an edge of fear. It's this amazement with an edge of fear. And what's interesting is they've learned how to actually study this. There's a number of different things that we can do or that you can do to inspire even just a little bit of awe. For sure, when you see something incredible, if you see the Grand Canyon, astronauts describe it as they have had this experience where they look down at the earth and as they're in orbit and they're looking down and it just, it, it just functionally kind of changes some things. You can watch a YouTube video. You can see stuff like we just looked at where it's these great, beautiful landscapes and it creates this small sense of awe and then they used a one to 10 scale to continue to rate stuff. And here's some of the really interesting and fascinating things that they found as they discovered. Keltner and others have found that even mild awe can change our attitudes and behavior. For example, people who watched a nature video that elicited awe rather than other positive emotions such as happiness or pride were subsequently more ethical, more generous, and described themselves as feeling more connected to people in general. Gazing up at a tall eucalyptus tree left others more likely to help someone who stumbled in front of them. And after standing in front of a Tyrannosaurus Rex skeleton, people were more likely to describe themselves as part of a group. And it might seem counterintuitive that an emotion we often experience alone increases our focus on others. But Keltner thinks it's because awe expands our attention to a compass, a bigger picture, so reducing our sense of self. It's interesting because as I was thinking about this, there's this, there's this dichotomy that happens in this season, which you're all familiar with, which is that as, as someone who follows Jesus, we oftentimes try to make sure that Jesus becomes the centerpiece of the season, that, that we're, you know, we have tons of nerdy Christian sayings of, you know, the reason for the season, you know, brother, right? You know, or <clears throat> you just, just, just stuff, you know, hope is dope. I don't know, like whatever your thing is, but 
We try to make Jesus at the center of, of, of this thing. And I think that the, the, the thing is I was kind of thinking, how does this all make sense? Is that basically, one, it assumes that, that Jesus is currently and always kind of in this center, in this season, in its busyness, and its chaos. It's difficult to remember that and to keep Jesus at the center as the reason for the season. But the reality is, is things don't get less busy, right? Your kids aren't less looking forward to presents, or you, some of you are still kids, and you're like, I can't wait till, to see what I get. Like, the, your days are numbered, okay? Just want you to know that. What do you get? What are you getting for Christmas? I don't know. I don't know. I haven't decided what I'm going to buy myself yet, right? Or my spouse using our same account that I can look up on our account statement at any point I want to. But it's this interesting thing that we try to fight. And I just think, here's, here's kind of, so here's the premise of this series. Is that central, central to what is, is the problem, is that this problem is not just specific in this season. This problem is revealing of the greater problem, which is that we oftentimes don't stand in awe and wonder of God. Because when we are in wonder, in awe of something, it functionally changes how we view the thing and how we view ourselves. Here's a couple more findings that I thought were interesting. In a large study, Keltner found that after inspiring awe in people from the U.S. and China, they signed their names smaller, they drew themselves smaller, but with no drop in, in their sense of status or self-esteem. In other words, you realize, and I realize, and we realize, not that we are less important, but there's something bigger happening here. Similarly, neuroscientist Michael Van Elk at the University of Amsterdam in the Netherlands found that people who watched awe-inducing videos estimated their bodies to be physically smaller than those who watched funny or neutral videos. Scooping down a little bit. First, focusing on the bigger picture rather than our own concerns seems a powerful way to improve health and quality of life. Keltner's team found that feeling awe makes people happier, less stressed, even weeks later, and that it assists the immune system. That sounds great in and of itself, right? Like, I don't even care if you believe in God or not. You're like, oh, that's a, that's a, that's a good take home, right? Makes me feel happier, less stressed, probably a corollary between the two, and healthier. A team from Arizona State University found that all activates the parasympathetic nervous system, which I know everybody is very savvy on, which works to calm fight or flight response. Researchers at Stanford University, California, discovered that experiencing all made people feel as if they had more time and made them more willing to give up their time to help others. In other words, when we are in awe of something bigger and greater than ourselves, what we actually come to the realization is not that we're less important, it's just that there is something bigger and greater than us going on. Now, let's just be honest. All of culture basically says, all of the world basically says, and even what we want to heal here in ourselves, it's not like it's blaming culture, even what we want to hear ourselves is that it's all about us. It's all about us. But there is this incredible phenomenon that is innate inside of us that when we experience and bump up against something so much bigger, so much greater, something inexplicable, something inside of us realizes there's something more than us. And I thought, man, this is what we need for Christmas. Because no matter what we do, I can't make life less busy. I can't make less, you know, work parties and less things to go to and less ugly Christmas sweaters, which I don't even know if there are like unugly Christmas sweaters at this point, right? It's just like it's a Christmas sweater. Oh, it's ugly. Okay. Right? Well, we can't make all that go away, but my goal is to say, man, what if we just took a couple of minutes and stood in awe and wonder of God? And the problem is, <laughs> that's not super easy to do. It's not like, oh, so let me say these five words about God, and everybody's like, what? Oh, I'm in awe. So I was like, maybe we need to go through Revelation and just confuse everybody. But then I started... Um, just honestly researching and looking and thinking and saying, okay, how can I, how can we creatively communicate this in a way that maybe drives at least a somewhat of a sense of an awe of God, that the infinite God came to planet Earth in the form of a baby in a feeding trough. 
And so I decided what I'm sure all of you guys are already thinking. We should go to Exodus chapter 19 and study the Ark of the Covenant, right? <clears throat> I know. But, but go with me here. And, and here's, why, here's why I think this. Because there's some stuff that I read that as I read this, I was like, man, this, this seems weird to me. This just seems excessive to me. And, and, and that began to uncover some things that I think are going to be really important for us that perhaps we have misestimated God. And in, in, in the Old Testament, um, they didn't just approach God. There was, there was a very intentional, systematic process that God laid out um, a number of different ways, and it kind of had already started, but was really kind of codified through Moses. Moses, as he's out Mount Sinai, is leading the people. And Moses, Moses has just led the people um, out, of, out of Egypt, and that was a, you know, this big thing. And, and as he's led them out, they're out there on this, that, this mountain, and reasonably so, Moses, I think, is kind of like, all right, God, well, I've led these people out. What now? Like, what do we, like, great, we're in the desert. Awesome. So glad we left civilization for the desert. And so, God, I need for them to know that when I talk to you, I'm actually talking to you. And so God says, okay, here's what we're going to do, Moses. So you can go Exodus chapter 19 as we're going to read some of this. Exodus chapter 19, starting at verse 9. And as the Lord said to Moses, behold, I am coming to you in a thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak with you. And they also believe you forever. In other words, okay, Moses, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to come to you. You're going to go up on this mountain. Um, as you go up on that mountain, I'm going to come to you. There's going to be this thick cloud. Everybody's going to see it, and everybody's going to know that he met with God. Now, pause. This, if we could just erase a lot of the cultural and the Christian context that we experience this in, um, what actually is happening in this is for one of the very first times in a very demonstrable way in front of a large group of people, they're looking and saying, oh, my gosh, he's meeting with God. Now, we just kind of do that. We just Instagram it and do a little moleskin thing and have a pen that we write with that's a little more expensive than we've tithed all month, right? But we've got like our little coffee shop and our little, you know, thing, and we're just kind of picturing it. And, oh, my gosh, this is so cool. And, my God, is an artist, right? But they're, they're looking at this thing. This is nuts. God is talking with a person. When Moses told the words to the people, or of the people to the Lord, the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their garments and be ready for the third day. In other words, Mo, here's what I want you to do. But by the way, I think he spoke to him on a, on a not just a first name basis, but on a nickname basis. He called him Big Mo. So, Mo, I want you to go and I want you to tell all the people, here's what I want you to do. I want you to tell them to get ready because the presence of God is going to be here. So, go ahead, wash your clothes, get your house ready consecrate yourself, which basically means take something normal and set it apart for it to be holy. I want you to set the nation aside and take a couple days to be set apart, to go through the rituals, the cleansings, the washings, to make yourself holy, because God is going to show up. For on the third day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. And you shall set limits for the people all around, saying, take care not to go up into the mountain, because they know that there's going to be that dude that's like, I'm going, right? There's going to be that person that's like, bro, did you see that cloud? I mean, we might as well run. So he says, so make sure that no one goes up into the mountain or touches the edge of it. I got to think that they were like, okay, which one is the edge of the mountain? Right, is this rock, does that include the edge? And he's like, I don't know, just don't touch it. Trust me from what I'm about to say. Whoever touches the mountain shall be put to death. No hand shall touch it, but he shall be stoned or shot. Whether beast or man, he shall not live, but when the trumpet sounds a long blast, they shall come up to the mountain. If we're being honest, in the wake of the New Testament, this can be very difficult for us to reconcile. This is, this is one of those verses where we look at and we frankly see discontinuity, or at least what we think is discontinuity between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Because the New Testament, Jesus is like, yes, let even, even the children come. The Old Testament, he's like, don't touch that rock. And we're going to get to why that is in, in a little while. But I think it's just interesting. Because honestly, when I'm reading this, I'm like, God, that just seems excessive. Like, basically what you're saying is, hey, no one come close. Not, not only don't run up it, I don't want anybody to even touch it. In fact, if anybody touches it, instead of someone going to lay his hand on him to pull him off of that, just shoot him. 
Like that, that just seems like a lot. And while I feel like that's revealing about a God that I have a difficult time reconciling, I think what it actually is revealing about is the fact that perhaps my view of God is one that doesn't actually think that God should be a God who can actually determine boundaries. That he's a God who has the ability to set parameters. Because again, we can meet with God all the time. But what we read is that this was not common They looked at it and they said, don't touch it. Don't touch the rock. Don't even come close to it because if you do, you will die. Now, here's here's the thing. Here's what we got to get. This is what happens any time sinful man comes into contact with the holiness of God. Now, let me ask you two questions that I think will make this all reconcile in and of itself. Number one, has anyone, if you saw this big, you know, one of the electro, one of the transformers outside that was unwrapped and the wire was exposed and you grabbed it and you died, right? Would anybody say that's so unfair of electricity? No, you'd say, you idiot, don't, drug, don't grab the power line, right? That's what's going to happen. Which do you think is more important? The electrical current running outside of the holiness of God. The fact that we see that unfair isn't actually indicative of God's fairness. It's indicative of our view of self, that we view ourselves so big, we think that we can touch God, see God, approach God in his holiness and not die. That should be the natural cause and reaction. And when they heard that, they said, of course, of course, of course. We're not going to approach it. We're not going to approach him. So God would set up with Moses this idea that he would come down in the cloud and he would meet with God. And so Moses would need to meet with God from time to time as they moved on from Mount Sinai, started wandering through the desert. They, they constructed kind of this, this thing called the Ark of the Covenant. It was this thing that God specifically told them what to make and specifically told them how to make it. And in it held a couple of really important things. It held the Ten Commandments. It held um, uh, Aaron's rod. And it would hold you know, one of the little baskets, one of the gold baskets that they would collect manna in as they walked through the desert. And from time to time, God would meet with Moses when Moses needed to meet with God in this one particular tent called the Tent of Meetings or the Tabernacle, another vernacular. And it would be set outside of the camp because this tent, this holy place, this incredible holy place could not be in the same place where the people were. Exodus, moving down a little bit, Exodus chapter 33, um, it says, Now Moses... Now, Moses, uh, starting at verse 7, used to take a tent and pitch it outside the camp some distance away, calling it the tent of meeting. And anyone inquiring of the Lord would go to the tent of meeting outside the camp. Whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people rose and stood at the entrances of the tent, their tents, watching Moses until he entered into the tent. As Moses went into the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and stay at the entrance while, while the Lord spoke with Moses. And whenever the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, they all stood and worshipped, each at the entrance of their tent. Because they're all sitting there saying, okay, we see Big Mo. He's talking to God right now. There's this cloud that just came down. And, man, we are staying at our own tent. Like, I'm going to have my own worship service here. I don't want to go to that worship night because I'm going to die if I go to that worship night. So I'm just going to stand here. I'm just going to worship God. Now, here's why this is important. Because, again, we live in a context to where, frankly, we're not very much in awe of God, wonder of God. This sense of amazement that's held in the one hand and this sense of fear in the other. I think this is massive. I think think the group of people that God will use to change the world is the people who can hold both this sense of awe and intimacy at the same time. The sense of I am intimate with God and I am terrified of him at the same time. He is so big. He is so powerful. He is so difficult to even conceptualize. It's funny because you read through Revelation. We were going through the seven churches and Chapter 4 has this picture of the throne room of God, and it's, you read it, and it's like, this is crazy stuff. This is wild. And it's because John 
is trying to describe something in earthly terms that is otherworldly. So he looks and he sees this thing. He's like, man, it's had all like these eyes, and it was kind of like this fire and this furnace and this glowing and this sea of glass slash crystal slash. It was just, it was. Do you realize that everything that we know is a derivative version of God basically saying it's the person of Jesus? Like everything that we know, even the language that we use to describe God, God does not use our language. He's not like, oh, actually, I'm, I only speak English. So the words that we use to describe God and understand God and see God and know God, that in and of itself is an anthropomorphism of God. In other words, we're using earthly manifestations and things to say, okay, this is, this is the closest thing that we can use to describe this God. In the Old Testament, they just got it. They were like, man, we cannot go close to this thing. Again, there was this time, the, Samuel describes, I think Chronicle has it as well, where there's this, there's this, this fellow by the name of Uzziah, or Uzziah and the, the tent, as they were about to make this temple, um, this tent was kind of going around, or this, this I'm sorry, this um, Ark of the Covenant was going around. And they had all these things about what you could and couldn't do and how you had to carry it and how you had to hold it and if you were going to touch it. And they were supposed to carry it on their shoulders. And this one particular time, they were, had it on a cart. And I think they just thought, oh, we're smarter than God. We'll just put it on a cart. God's like, I'm telling you, it's not going to work out. And so nonetheless, well, I guess one of the oxen trips, something happens. The, the, um, the ark starts to kind of like go down a little bit. They had all these sheets that were covering it. Uzziah reaches out his hand to stop it from falling, and all of a sudden he falls over as if dead. We look at that and say, that's ridiculous. He says, no, 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 that's just the holiness of God. But we live in such a grace-saturated culture, which is an amazing thing, but the problem is, is we live in a culture so saturated with grace, we don't understand the holiness, and so we see discontinuity instead of seeing forgiveness. You see, the only person that could actually go into the place, the holiness of God, they call it the Holy of Holies. So after the tent happened, after David happened, Solomon, David's son, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Solomon erects this incredible temple, this beautiful, ornate, massive temple. And at the center of the temple was the Holy of Holies, of which only the high priest could go. But the high priest could only go once a year. And before the high priest even went into this thing, into the presence of God, the high priest had to go through this entire system of bathing and cleansing and washing. And then after he did all of that, he would go through and he would make a sacrifice of like bulls and and, and all kinds of animals, one for his sin, two for the sin of his family, three for the sin of his nation, just so he would be temporarily clean enough to go into the presence of the derivative version of the presence of the holiness of God. Like, do we get that we get to spend time with that God every day? There's just such a contrast. And so for them to go into the presence of God, and it was massive, it was overwhelming. And they had to go through all these processes, all these rituals. As this God who is this God of the tent, who is this God of the tabernacle, as this God who is this God who his presence dwelled in this place, and on top of this place, all these sacrifices would be made right in and around the mercy seat of God, which was the top of it, which would actually make it approachable. And this is what they're used to. Now, I want you to imagine, if this is the God, like that's all you know about God. Take everything that we have learned, everything that we know, everything that we have experienced in terms of spending time with God, the people of God, the presence of God. I want you to imagine we take all of that away, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, the infinite God becomes not just a person, not just I'm floating down and I'm zapping bad guys, right? Like, because by the way, we're all bad guys. That would be a pretty difficult thing for him to do, right? But he's just, he comes down and he's born as a baby in a feeding trough. I want you to hear the language that John uses in John chapter 1. One of the things I love about John chapter 1, John, which is one of the, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the four accounts of Jesus' life. And so John describes kind of the theological overlay of what was happening Christmas morning. This is what John says in John chapter 1. Verse 14, he said, in the word, this is the way that he would describe the logos, which was God in a culture that they would kind of identify and connect with. 
And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Now, can't miss this. John, who wrote Revelation, who obviously is very, uh, he's a big fan of imagery and connecting dots. He says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. This word dwelt in the original Greek is fascinating. You know what it means? Tabernacled, tinted among us. He says, in the same way, the presence of God that was wildly unapproachable in the Old Testament, tabernacled, was present, tinted, dwelt among us. Some of you guys, you've heard of this weird term called hypostatic union, which basically just means that God was fully man, fully God, that he was a union of both, and that's kind of unbelievable because he was 100% God, 100% man. How can you be 200%? Mm, I don't know. Good luck with that math, right? But he was. But the reason that, by the way, he had to be in, in, in bodily form is because if Jesus came present in any other form except for bodily form, in human form, fully flesh and fully God, we would die. But he dwelt among us was present among us, tabernacled among us. Not too long ago, I had the opportunity to... I talked to a, uh, talked to a dad. Um, his daughter goes to our church. She's a phenomenal athlete. Soccer team, they just won the national championship. Shout out, ladies. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know I kind of transitioned to the sermon, which kind of sets you up. You're like, can we woo on that one? Yes, yes is the answer. <clears throat> and I was just asking, what's it like to raise a kid who, you know, is just, you know, has, a, has, a, has obviously an incredible acumen for, for athletics and, and things like that, and, you know, just kind of gleaming for, like, thoughts, ideas, insights. And he was telling me all about it. He was telling me a couple things that I thought, oh, that's interesting. I, 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 think I, I think I agree with that. And as he was going on, I was talking about, you know, how fear of failure kills talent and how they focused on effort and attitude, and that's kind of become the hallmark of what we talk about at our family now, or one of the hallmarks of what we talk about at our family. He talked about a couple of the things about his thoughts about burnout, his thoughts about, you know, um, I fear not the man who has practiced 10,000 kicks, but practiced one kick 10,000 times, and now it just takes repetition, 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 all this kind of stuff. Well, so I'm listening, and just kind of like everybody else, you, got, you know how you are to be parents. Like, you hear somebody else's parenting style, and you're like, okay, we'll see. You know, like, we'll compare kids later. You know, like, he, he would win that battle right now, by the way. But what was interesting is towards the end of it, so we were talking, it was, um, you know, dad, mom, and then a, a couple of fellas that they had known. And I was talking to one of the guys, and he had, you know, um, he had shorts that had, you know, Tampa Bay Bucks on them. And you, you guys know this. When you meet a dude who's like in his 60s, late 50s, early 60s, and he's wearing gym shorts, you're like, eh, you know, I'm not going to listen to this guy. So y'all are judging me while I'm judging you, which is fair, which is fair to be fair. <clears throat> I don't really. But anyways, here's what happened. So let me tell you the story. So what happened actually was um, I, was, I was talking to him. It turns out the dude was the, uh, the chaplain for the Bucks for like 29 years. And I was like, oh, man, that's awesome start talking about it. He's telling me about it. I'm like, so where did you guys meet? They're like, oh, we met in Tampa. I'm like, neat. So let me ask that question again. Where did you guys meet, right? Like, great, we met in Tallahassee. That's not, that's very indescript. That's a geographical location. How did you guys meet? So then he says, the dad, and he was so humble about this, and he was, it was very kind. He goes, well, yeah, man, I, I played for the Bucks for a number of years. I was like, what? You know? He was like, yeah, and I was like, when did you play for the Bucks? He was, you know, he starts telling me that basically he played for four or five years for the Bucks um, when they won their Super Bowl, when he was across from John Lynch's safety, and they ran the Tampa 2. I'm like, what, the Tampa 2? Some of you guys have no clue what that is. That's legendary defense. That's all that is. It's just a massive deal, right? So he's telling me about that, and he's telling me about his, like, how he then played a couple years with the Seahawks. And let me tell you this, just to be honest, like, I was, I was really paying attention to what he was saying anyways. When I heard that, and I realized not only has he been there, he has helped his kids to get there too. I'm like, dude, I am paying attention to what you're saying. I just thought, man, what if that was us for Christmas? And by that, I mean, what if we just realized, okay, that's the God that I'm talking to. I need to listen a little differently. When I have an orientation of something bigger, greater, grander, and more grandeur than myself, then perhaps I just, it shifts my posture to where I listen a little bit differently because I actually think that this person knows what the heck he's talking about. 
And I was thinking, man, what if our problem with Christmas, what if our problem is not that we need to try to focus on Jesus in the middle of the busyness, we need to realize the massiveness of God, be in awe of God, and a sense of wonder of God. And if that's true, unintentionally, it almost just functionally shifts how we view who we are and how we exist in this entire world. Because it makes us more humble. It makes us more kind. It makes us more cognizant of us. In fact, I started to think about this. I don't, I don't know if I'm willing to like, ascribe to this yet, because I just am not 100% convinced, but I think it makes sense. That most times when we go through a season of dryness spiritually, some of you guys know that, you, you feel a sense of dryness. What if that sense of dryness wasn't actually a sense of dryness? What if it wasn't the presence of dryness? What, is it? what if it was the absence of awe? We just haven't been in awe of God in a while. We're fairly unimpressed. But what if we just knew, I should die simply by talking about him? This is what the writer of Hebrews says in chapter 9. To kind of wrap all these thoughts up. Now, even the first covenant, talking about the Old Testament, had regulations for worship in an earthly place for holiness. For a tent was prepared, the first section in which were the lampstands and the table and the bread of presence, it is called the holy place. But behind the second curtain, that's in the holy of holies, was a second section called the most holy place, having the golden altar of incense and the ark of the covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden urn holding the manna, Aaron's staff that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. Above it were a cherubim of, gold, of glory overshadowing the mercy seat, which was a big deal, by the way. Of these things, we cannot now speak in detail. But these preparations, having thus been made, the priests go regularly into the first section performing the ritual duties. But, but into the second, only the high priest goes. Only the high priest would go into that one. And but once a year, and not without taking blood, which he offered for himself and for the unintentional sins of the people. In other words, he would go in and he would offer the sacrifice of blood, and the sacrifice of blood would make them temporarily clean. There would be some type of a sacrifice to pay some type of a restitution. By this, the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the holy places is not, not yet opened as long as the first section is still standing, which is symbolic for the present age. According to this arrangement, gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper, but deal only with the food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until the time of reformation. In other words, those things were super temporary. Just for a little bit so we could experience a little bit of God. But they were a buildup. They were a lead up. That if, if the blood of an animal would temporarily put us or put one person once a year with the ability to be in the presence of God. He says this. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, Jesus not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of blood of goats and of calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of flesh. He says, so if all that was kind of a eh, kind of version of flesh, of sprinkling, of making better. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? In other words... 
The only way, the only way that we now have the presence of the Holy Spirit, the only way that we can now speak to God, the only way that we can now have a relationship with God, commune with with God without dying, because if we were ever in God's presence sans Jesus, it is simply impossible because, because of the functional principles and properties of the holiness and the glory of God that we would die. But when we have Jesus in the same way in the Old Testament that they would they take the blood and it would cause a temporary washing. He says, Jesus, the ultimate sacrifice, God himself created the eternal sacrifice so that henceforth in all of creation, in all of human history, that we now have access to God. And he came down to planet earth. He didn't expect us to just simply live better lives and holier lives, which is most of religion, if we're being honest. Be a better person, be a better person, be a better person. And perhaps if you're a good enough person, God will find you to be good. The problem with the holiness and the glory of God is when we actually see that, we realize no matter how good I am, I will never be perfect, and I will, I will never be, and I was actually never supposed to be. That all of this was a buildup so I wouldn't miss Jesus, so that we wouldn't miss Jesus, so that humanity wouldn't miss Jesus. There's not discontinuity. We live in a culture so saturated with grace that we don't see God as holy. But he is. And what if we were in awe of that constantly? My guess is, as churches, we would, we would disagree a lot less. We would realize half the stuff that we disagree about doesn't really matter that much. There's a kingdom. There is a God. He sits on his throne. And we're not to squabble with each other. We're just to kneel and submit. That we realize That the only reason we have access to God is not because we're good people. In light of our sinfulness, our intentional rebellion against God, God saw us, knew us, sent his only son to die for us. Before we had even committed a sin, we were not even in existence yet. And he died for us. So that we could have a relationship with him. Not only would we be able to be blown away by the fact that we get the eternal God, the infinite God. But we actually get to call him our heavenly father. And man, I just hope we're in awe of that. I hope we don't see the Old Testament and think there's something wrong with God. I hope we see the New Testament and say there's something inexplicable about God because there's no reason for a holy God, a glorious God like that, that he should die for people like us who have rebelled. That's the love of God. And now we live for God, and you guys know this, not because we have to, because we get to. Not because if we don't, God's going to hate us and disown us. It's because we actually trust God. If you're that big, that glorious, that holy, and you tell me to do something, I'm going to trust what you say over what I think and what I feel. So I'm just going to submit to you. That's being a Christian. Now, this sermon, to be fair, doesn't have a ton of like, here's the immediate application. So go home, and tomorrow when you wake up, you know, write this one little phrase down. I just hope it just kind of makes us, gives us a little bit of a different lens, a little bit different view, that we would all just stand in awe and wonder of God. This God who is so glorious, this God who is so beautiful, this God who truthfully, this, you heard it song Amazing Grace? This is what makes grace amazing. It's amazing, the holiness and the glory of God, the unapproachableness of God that we get to approach because of the person of Jesus. Jesus is like that little rubber thing and the little plastic thing that wraps the power on that we can now grab onto the holiness of God, the person of God, have the spirit of God inside of us and not die, and it's only because of Jesus and his blood. So he just thought, man, here's the application. We're going to sing one more song together. And I just want this to be somewhat of a shift in our minds. And whether you stand or whether you sit, whether you sing or you simply pray, and shoot, for you, man, you might, you might not even be sure where you are if you think about God, if you believe in God, if God even exists. And let me just tell you, that's okay. That's okay. You don't think God's big enough to hold your doubt? There's a dude named Thomas. 
who he was plenty big for, when he says, I'm not going to believe it until I put my fingers through his wrists. And Jesus said, all right, come on, big dog. He didn't say it in those terms. That's the Ben revised version. <laughs> but I just want you to think, maybe it's true. And maybe if you saw Christians who actually lived in all of God, maybe you wouldn't ever think it's true. But perhaps you would be convinced that they think it's true. Maybe that's why you're here. I don't know. But here's what I do know. Is that there is a God who our universal condition as people, no one is better. No one is better. To his unapproachable light, all of us fall so unbelievably short. It's only because of Jesus that we can approach the Father. No one is better than you. No one is worse than you. We are all just people who are sinful to the core of who we are. We can choose good things from time to time, but to compare to his perfection, just ain't happening. And what if we were just in awe of that? What if we, before we picked up our Bible, think, man, if I would have touched this rock in the Old Testament, I would have died. But now I can actually just, well, this is an iPad, but like pick up the word of God, you know? You get what I'm saying. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much. And honestly, God, we are, one, I hope that made sense. Two, it's even the best thoughts, the best attempts, the clearest exposition of your grandeur, your glory, your holiness so, falls so short of the reality of it. But God, I pray that if we just get a little glimpse of you, a little glimpse of your holiness, a little glimpse and stand in awe and wonder of who you are, of your glory, God, knowing that it's only, only, only because of the blood of Jesus that our sins are washed away as the bulls and the calves and everybody did in the Old Testament, as their blood was shed for a temporal sense of covering and anointing so your person could go into your presence once a year. When your son died and his, his blood was shed for us, we now all run into the presence of you, our incredible, indescribable, unimaginable, holy, heavenly Father. We get to spend time. We get to have you. Would you please help us to be in awe and in wonder of who you are, Jesus, of who you are, God. And I pray not that the season gets less busy, less chaotic, or less stressful, but that we see ourselves less as we realize, as we're in awe and wonder of who you are, God. I pray that you would change us from the heart as we simply experience you, Jesus. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.